Good morning, everybody online. Uh, welcome to South Pike Community Church Sunday School. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, and if you're following along in our book uh, by Ken Ham, we're going to be on page 59. All right, <clears throat> so I thought there were a couple really interesting points that Ken makes. If you remember, we were getting to the point, in fact, can someone <clears throat> read verse 10? Talked about the earth. And God called the dry land earth and gathered together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Yeah, so <clears throat> we have a gathering together of the waters called the seas. Then we have the gathering together of <clears throat> all of the earth, and that would be our one continent. And we, we've spent a lot of time discussing what this continent might have looked like and all those types of things. I do think that there was something interesting that he pointed out. And if you turn to put a bookmark there, <clears throat> notice in Psalm 8, verse 8. <clears throat> Sorry, I have uh, no voice. I started coaching this week, so my voice is going to be incredibly weak uh, trying to talk. Uh, <clears throat> can someone read Psalm 8 8? <clears throat> the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I don't know if you haven't had a chance to read on page 58. But Ken talks about a 19th century scientist named Matthew Maury. And this guy, in fact, <clears throat> on his tombstone, well, he was known as the Pathfinder of the Seas. And on his tombstone read the verse Psalm 8.8. And what we now know about the oceans is, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at like the Atlantic Ocean, a lot of people, you know, they, they don't realize like part of the challenge that European explorers had in the 1400s was that there's a bunch of invisible currents in the ocean. You have the North Atlantic Current, you have South Atlantic Current, you have one off the coast of Africa called the Angola Current that literally goes in a giant circle. You have global wind patterns, all these types of things. And I believe personally that's what Psalm 88 is referring to, the path of the seas. There is a path and you know, the Vikings discovered it first Europeans discovered it later, <clears throat> but this guy later on, he actually created the science of what's called oceanography, uh, this 19th century scientist. And he accredited God in Psalm 8.8 with telling us about this discipline well before he ever discovered it, well before explorers and sailors ever you know, found the currents in the oceans and mapped them out and all that stuff. So it's really fascinating. Um, you know, if you look at Psalm 8, 8, the path uh, of the seas, or the pass, uh, pass through the paths of the seas. There might be different wording depending on, you know, what version you're, you're using. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I thought that was fascinating. Uh, now, if you go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1, I want to get back into the topic that we were saying. Um, <clears throat> when we said, when, when, let's actually get someone to read this. Can someone read 11 and 12 of Genesis chapter 1? There was a phrase in there we, we pointed out. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs that yield seeds, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, those seeds in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herbs that yield the seeds according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Yeah. It's a phrase. Did anybody catch the big phrase? That, that, of its kind. Yes. We would say it kind of refutes yeah. evolution, if you will. It's the phrase of its kind or according to its kind. Now, your version, depending on what it is, might phrase that differently. But <clears throat> what we come to understand through examining <laughs> science, there was a guy named uh, Carolus Linnaeus. Um, making sure I pronounce it. Carolus Linnaeus, actually. Some people pronounce it Linnaeus. But he created the animal category, categoriz help me out here, how do you say the word? Categorization that we think of today. You know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And what he did was he read Genesis chapter one 
and he was inspired to categorize the animals based on what he saw. And the idea is, you know, you look at uh, dogs, for example. Dogs come from wolves, the wolf ancestor. And so, but dogs have changed a lot over the years. There's still some <clears throat> tendencies in our modern dogs, like, you know, uh, me having a, a Shih Tzu. You know, they're not hunting dogs, but there's still the desire to, you know, if you give them some chicken and some, some, some meat, you know, they're going to they're gonna go crazy for it. There's still some wolf-like instincts there. But dogs have changed a lot over the years. Have you, have you ever heard of a dog turning into something that looks like a kangaroo? Have you ever heard of a dog turning into something um, like a feline? Have you ever heard of a lizard uh, turning into a bird? Uh, no. Now, the only place you've ever heard that account is in the textbook. Because in reality, what they basically say, and they being scientists, and I've actually studied this because this is part of my degree. Um, I haven't studied the biology aspect, but more the fossils aspect of this, is that they claim that there's these middle transitionary pieces in between animals to show that lizards might have evolved into birds, you know, dinosaurs might have evolved into birds, and, and, and so they claim that there's these pieces in between that connect them together, but the fact is, there's not. It's the biggest lie in scientific history. There are no transitional fossils. There's no fossils that show primates slowly um, ascending into humanity. There's no in-betweens. All they find are primate fossils. And when you find a fossil of something, you know one thing about it immediately. It's dead. And that's the thing we know for certain. You could probably tell whether it's female or male. You could tell height. A little bit about diet from an anthropology or, or archaeological perspective but when you find bones in the ground that's evidence that something died there you, there there are no connection pieces between this primate this primate this primate leading to humans and unfortunately the textbooks that kids are reading these days want you to believe that yes the answer has been solved they have you go down the list, they have these really fancy names like Australopithecus afarensis, which they believe is our primate ancestor. They say, well, there's a perfect path from that to what would be like Homo neanderthalus and then eventually to Homo sapiens. But the fact is, that's a fiction. If you actually look at the scientific, the fossil record, there are no connection pieces. Even if they claim there are, I've examined them <laughs> and they can't tell me that they're there when I know that they don't exist. And so the transitional fossils are the biggest thing for evolutionists. Now, how does this tie into plants? Because plants are the same as animals. It says that they produce after their kind. Now, does that mean, okay, does that mean that there can't be variations? Absolutely. You're not going to see a little flower eventually evolve into a palm tree, though. That's just not going to happen. But whenever it says after its kind, it means that uh, you know, there can be some level of variation, but it's generally the same type of thing. You know, bats, sponges, and bananas do not have the same common ancestor. The common ancestor of bats was a bat. Common ancestor of bananas is some type of fruit similar to a banana. Um, the common ancestor of corn, as we said last week, was some little skinny bean-like thing that we we said probably was accessed by the Native Americans and probably manipulated through growing and stuff over generations, over eons. But that doesn't mean that the corn ancestor, the dog ancestor, and a sponge in the sea has the same root ancestor. And that's what, that's what the textbooks in science teach. They teach that all living things on Earth come from a common ancestor. And so... I would argue to you that there are many common ancestors, but the thing is, a dog's common ancestor is a dog. A cat's common ancestor is some type of primeval saber-toothed tiger, some type of cat. And so you, you don't see things producing things that are not the same as them today. And so that, that's my biggest thing with this. Now, that's what it means when it says after its kind. And that'll come into play when we talk about the animals too. Now notice the other phrase here, it says, whose seed is in itself. Because the old question is, which one came first, the chicken or the egg? Which one came first, the seed or the plant? 
It was the plant that came first. And then the seeds obviously were given off and these plants were able to be grown. But it was, it was the, the plant that came first. Now notice one really interesting thing, whose seed is in itself. If you think about that, if you really dive into the language there, what that means is that the seed of the corn has the ability to create all sorts of genetic variation based on itself, based on what God put into it. See, God put into dogs all the information that would need to be there. All we have done through breeding is just unlock what God's already created. See, evolutionists like to teach that nature through natural selection has basically caused animals to develop new information. And I would argue the opposite. I would argue that all the animal variations we see were there at the beginning. It's just a matter of breeding over generations. It's eventually unlocked all those hidden genes. Now, do we know that that's possible? Absolutely. We see people adapting and changing. You adapt based on living in a cold environment versus a hot environment. You see, even in fact, um, the term natural selection has actually, I think, been hijacked by Darwin. We do see natural selection, but it's not creating new information. It's just unlocking information that was already there. You look at Darwin's finches. Some of the finches were able to survive based on their beaks. Unfortunately, because of changing environment and other stuff, ones with less suitable features died off. And so the strongest will survive, unfortunately, in a fallen world, some will die. So as Christians, this is going to sound crazy, we don't completely have to reject evolution. We have to reject macro evolution. That means everything has a common ancestor. People came from apes. We reject that. But it doesn't mean we have to say change hasn't happened. Evolution means change. At a micro level, it's happened. And we understand that. And we don't have to say that natural selection doesn't exist. Of course, we understand that nature, you know, some animals die off. There's a reason why we have extinct species, but it's not creating new things. Yes. Yeah, actually, um, if you look at the genetic code, there's actually been a loss of information. In, in yes. We, and that's very important because that would explain, as we see these variations, that through systematically, that has created a scenario by which we genetically the kinds you see are somewhat inferior in the sense of loss of information mm -hmm. in the genetic code and also you've never seen any variation within a genetic code where it adds information that's, that's very that's important true. so yeah information is not added never the other thing is when it's you look lost. at it like my dog <clears throat> would represent a lack of information compared to the original ancestor right. um you know, my dog, if you put him out there in the wilderness, he ain't going to be surviving. Um, yeah, he ain't going to be doing too well. So just to get you an idea, yeah, there's been all sorts of changes and, and, and things. But, yeah, no new information has been added. In fact, I would say it's represented a loss of information. And so um, I would encourage you guys on your own to read up to page 63. There's some really, really interesting examples of why evolution wouldn't work, especially on page 63. They talk about how complex the universe is. So for example, they talk about different bugs that help plants live. But how would the bug that relies on the plant, the plant that relies on the bug, how would they both evolve at the same time without all of them dying off, if they in fact rely on each other? And so the universe is so complex it couldn't have evolved because for it to evolve, these things within the universe that we see, like bees, pollinating plants, but they rely on each other. Which one evolved first? And, and how did that one evolve without the other one if they rely on each other? And so he gives some really good examples of uh, arguments on page 63. One in particular, you could look more up on answersingenesis.org. Uh, there are some really good arguments there. Um, but let's move on. We're on chapter 4. This is page 65. I don't actually know what the picture is supposed to entail. I think that's the sun. It's really cool looking though. Looks like some kind of painting, uh, famous painting. Um, can someone read? I'm looking to see how far we want to go here. Yeah, can someone read verses 14 through 16 of Genesis chapter 1? Then 
God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now notice what it says there. I love that part because it says he made the stars also. Uh, do I want to count how many zeros there are here on page 67 with how many stars there are? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24. One with 24 zeros after it. That's a big number. That's an estimate of how many st stars there are in the universe. I would argue to you that the universe is not eternal. The universe has a limit. God is the only um, thing, well, I don't want to say thing, but he's the only eternal um, entity that's, that's there. And so the universe, I think you make a good example, does have an outward limit. We don't know exactly what that is. But the stars are in the trillions upon trillions times trillions numbers here. Uh, and we'll get into why the universe is so big. There's some good reasons for that with scripture. But notice the uh, wording in verse uh, 16. Um, the stars also, I wrote here on the board, uh, and it says here, he made the stars also at the end of verse 16. You know, you look at it, what is the creation of trillions upon trillions of stars is summed up <clears throat> in literally just a few words, five words. You got five words describing the creation of this multitude of stars. More than the sand on the seashores of all the earth would be the stars in the universe. Um, much more. And so, you know, I just think it's fascinating that it doesn't go into like a whole explanation. It just says, yeah, he made the stars also. It just shows you how par powerful God is. Is that he creates, and it's just like a side note. Yeah, he created trillions and trillions of stars. Yeah, it's not a big deal for him. And I think that that's why Moses, in fact, was inspired to write such a short phrase. Um, now, when it says in verse 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the light from the day. Um, this in particular is talking about, uh, when it says lights, it's talking about light givers, as Ken Ham points out on page 60, uh, 65. Light givers. So we understand like the moon, for example, doesn't give light of itself but it emanates the light of the sun. The sun is more of something that actually gives off light itself, being basically a ball of uh, burning gas, if you will, that's uh, eventually winding down. So what's the purpose then of these lights? Well, you notice some interesting things. Uh, at the end of verse 14, signs and seasons for days and years. Signs would be, you know, there are certain astronomical markers you know, when you see certain things in the sky at certain time periods, you know, you see different uh, bodies in the constellations, and those can be used to mark off different time periods. Um, obviously, we've talked about seasons. In fact, one of the biggest ones, if you look at, well, everybody knows, does everybody know how to find the Big Dipper? Like, everybody knows what the Big Dipper looks like. It just looks like a, like a pot that you boil water in. So this, this is the best example and one of the few examples because I teach American history that I can think of. I'm talking about seasons. Uh, the Big Dipper basically points right to Polaris, which is the North Star. And so you can basically measure out, if you look at the end of the Big Dipper, if you measure out five lengths from like how wide the end of the Big Dipper is, you measure out five lengths directly on top of it, it points right to the North Star. Okay, now why is that a big deal? Well, it's interesting. If you watch the Big Dipper, it actually rotates counterclockwise around Polaris. And so in the summer, it'll be on one side, you know, it'll be in the upper left. In the fall, it'll be in the bottom left. In the winter, it'll be on the bottom right. And then in the spring, it's actually just now making its way into the upper right corner of Polaris. So if you were to look at the North Star, you'll see the Big Dipper to the upper right of it. Now, you know, you might be thinking, well, I can tell what season it is because obviously, you know, <laughs> it's, it's cold. Now, that's true. Now, in some parts of the world, this was a means for them to keep track of time. For slaves in the south, during the days of the Underground Railroad, it was a way for them to find their way north. They could look 
In fact, there was actually a song called Follow the Drinking Gourd. It was a coded song that slaves used to basically find their way north along the uh, Underground Railroad. It had all kinds of hidden messages and stuff in it, but the big thing was that slaves knew the, the, the Big Dipper as the drinking gourd, because it looked like a gourd you would drink out of. And so they would use that to fall, find the North Star, and then they could find their way to Detroit, and then find their way to Canada. And so obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I just think it's really cool because God left these things as markers and they've been used by sailors, by escaped slaves, people trying to help them escape. People throughout the eons have used the stars for all these purposes. Well, and also let's dispel the idea that these signs, that by that verse, God is not affirming the use of astrological um, like the like like astrology, for instance, where yeah. we have perverted that. So first of all, that is unbiblical. That is because the yeah. actual word there, if I'm not mistaken, in Hebrew is a two part word that basically means for seasons or seasonal. And if that is the case, then God, in His foreknowledge, understood that eventually the Jews would need these phases to hold their festivals, but also right. people would use that for navigational purposes, not for the misuse right of. now things come about in the sky different times different <clears throat> years right. and, and that would be more what the signs are looking for Correct. when it says signs it's not talking about future telling or determining your personal future and things like that based on the position of the stars yeah and unfortunately that's why moses included that here because unfortunately a lot of people at the time period were worshiping the stars they believe people descended from the stars in fact so uh really crazy stuff um you know, and obviously for days and years, we understand that. We've talked about days, obviously, the spinning of the earth. You have years, the earth rotating around the sun. You have months based on the lunar calendar, the moon. So, yeah, there's some really big purposes. Now, I want you to really catch something else because now Ken doesn't really get into this much. I think because this is kind of geared more for adults and kids. But there is a question within Christianity, and I would say that this is the hardest question for, to answer if you believe in a young earth. So if you believe in a young earth and a young universe, um, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There is a question that exists that is extremely hard to answer. And that is, if we live in a young universe, how did, how did the starlight get here so quickly? Because we know, now you might say, well, why is starlight a big deal? Well, light only goes so fast. Light goes about 186,000 miles per second, okay? It goes about 186,000 miles per second. And so if you look at how far away the distant galaxies are, quasars, clumps of stars, and things like that, they exist at a very far distance. It would take billions of years for that light to travel to Earth. And so how is it that the universe isn't, in fact, billions of years old? Um, and I would say two things. We do have very good answers for this question. Just a lot of people don't really discover these answers. The other thing is, I would say that for old Earth creationists and people who believe in the Big Bang, they have their own light issue as well. They have an issue with the Big Bang, and they, that's why they've had to adjust it over the years. It's a light travel problem, and we'll discuss that as well. So, um, but I want to talk to you about distant starlight. I hope, does, it, does everybody understand the, the disparity there, the difficulty? If you believe in a young universe, you believe the universe is five to 6,000 years old, as the Bible teaches, well, how in the world did light get here that would have taken billions of years to get here? So a lot of people just immediately say, well, hey, maybe the speed of light was faster in the past. It's possible. That's a possible answer. I'm not going to rule that out. But I will say that I think that creates more problems than what's necessary. It is possible that light was faster, but without getting too technical, I want you to understand something. The universe we live in, if you ever heard of the guy with the crazy hair and the mustache, Albert Einstein, he discovered something about our universe. It's called relativity. Relativity is literally the rule book for how our entire universe works. E equals MC squared. Does anybody know what the C stands for? Speed of light. Speed of light. Our entire universe is built on the fact that the speed of light has stayed the same over its entire existence. So that means if you change the speed of light, 
it, it, it will literally change the fabric of the entire universe. Um, you'd have to change everything we know about physics. And so, yes, light could have been faster in the past. That could be an answer. There's also another answer that young Earth creationists propose, and I think it's probably the second best option, is that uh, in the early universe when God created everything, it's possible that there were black holes. Does anybody know what happens to time in a black hole? How quickly time flows? Yes. What's that, Dad? It stands still. It stands still. So it could be in the early universe, because of all the matter and everything clumped together, some young Earth creationists have actually said that the early universe could have been what we would call a black hole, time would have flowed very slow. And so therefore, the light could have made its way in. Again, I don't think we need to go there. Uh, uh, one of my friends who I, uh, I work with, who used to attend here, he said, why even, why even go to that point? Why even try to, it, I've more mentioned that just as a point that there are options. It's not like as Christians, we don't have any answers to this question. But I would give you what I think is the best answer to think of, and I want to show you this on the board, uh, because you notice one key phrase. Notice what it says at the end of verse 15. It says, to give light on the earth. Now, what's the last part of verse 15? And it was so. What that means is God created the stars on day four to give light on the earth, and it was so on day four. That means it didn't take billions of years to get the light to Earth. We don't have to try to slow time down to figure this out. God did it. Um, some people say it's just a miracle, and that's fine. God can perform miracles. Miracles do exist. And you have to remember something. Within the first six days of creation, God was running the universe differently then than he's running it now. God did not fix the laws of physics until the end of verse of day six. Remember, everything operates as it is after day six. Well, that didn't happen until after day six. God set everything in place. And so it could be that God just performed a miracle. But we understand here that the light did arrive on day four. The text says that. And so now we must ask the question, how did it get here so fast? So I would argue, number one, it could be a miracle. It could just be we don't have the answer. And things were done differently then. But there is another answer, um, and I don't want to, because it's 1006, I don't want to get into a ton of explanation on this because I want to actually pick this up next week. But I want you to think of a, a, an example here. And I want to leave you with this. There is a model that someone at G Answers in Genesis came up with to answer this very question. His name is Jason Lyle. He has a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Colorado. And he said something very interesting. He said, what if you take a mirror and you take a laser pointer or a flashlight and you shoot a beam of light at that mirror and it comes right back at you, right? Because if you shoot a laser at a mirror, it's going to fly right back at you. Let's say the round trip out and back is two seconds. How long did the light take to get out and how long did the light take to get back? If it was two seconds total, most people say in their head, well, the light must have taken a second to get out and a second to get back. The problem with that is, in physics, we don't know that. There is, a, there is a principle within physics that says you can't actually measure the speed of light in one direction. In fact, we have no idea how long it takes the light to travel out and back. We just know that it took two seconds for the light to go out and back. That's it. You can only measure the round trip speed of light. And this is what I want to leave you with. I don't want to explain the full thing because I want you to come back next week. But uh, no, it's, you can actually look it up on Answers in Genesis. I'll give you the name of it so you can search it for yourself this week. It's complex. But the thing is, in physics, and Einstein told us this, they told us this, you cannot measure the light, the speed of light in one direction. You can only measure the round trip speed of light. And that my friends, unlocks the door for telling us how light got here so quickly, is the fact that we cannot measure how fast it goes in a single direction. And this is, in fact, the answer. The answer, I believe, is what's called the ASC model. If you search this on Answers in Genesis uh, and put in the name, uh, he won't mind, uh, Jason Lyle, 
Uh, you should be able to put ASC model, Jason Lyle, and you should be able to find it. Now, I don't want to list the full name because I'm not even sure if I can spell it. It's called the Anisentropic Synchrony Convention. But it's a fancy way of saying we can get the light here in 24 hours, and it's not a problem with the Bible. Uh, so I hope that's not too complicated. We're going to slow that down next week, and uh, no pun intended, and we're going to get to that. So I will uh, close us in prayer here. Those of you online, I uh, just watched the last 10 minutes again. That was too much crammed in, and uh, I hope that wasn't too confusing. God bless you all. All right. <clears throat>